To deal with invasive pythons, the United States did something unprecedented, releasing robotic rabbits into the swamp. The goal was very clear, to control invasive pythons, but the consequences went far beyond anyone's expectations. Burmese pythons are not native to Florida. They were legally sold for many years as exotic pets in the United States. When young pythons are only about 40 to 50 centimeters long and appear harmless. But after just two to three years, a single python can reach four to five meters in length and weigh more than 70 kilograms. An adult female can lay between 50 and 100 eggs per clutch. This rate of growth and reproduction far exceeded what owners ever anticipated. When pythons grew too quickly, many people could no longer keep them, so they released them into the natural environment. This did not happen just a few times, but was repeated over many years. Then, a major hurricane swept across Florida, destroying containment facilities and releasing large numbers of pythons into the Everglades swamp. This region has a year-round warm climate, abundant water, and almost no natural predators strong enough to control them. As a result, pythons reproduced and spread extremely fast, invading millions of hectares of wetlands. Ecological surveys show that in areas with high python density, populations of small mammals such as weasels, rabbits, and raccoons have declined by 80 to 90 percent. There have been recorded cases of pythons swallowing an entire adult deer, as well as multiple confrontations with American alligators, where both animals ended up dead. The first human response was hunting. Florida opened access to hunters and legalized the removal and transport of pythons. But hunting is only effective when prey leaves clear signs and moves along predictable paths, something pythons simply do not do. Most of the time they remain motionless underwater or hidden in dense vegetation, appearing only briefly before vanishing again. After many years of bounties, manpower deployment, and budget spending, the number of pythons removed remained only a very small fraction compared to their reproduction rate. When traditional measures no longer worked, the problem was no longer about how many pythons could be shot. The question became, if pythons cannot be found in the swamp, is it possible to make them reveal themselves? At that point, the old approach came to an end. A different path was chosen. The problem was no longer how to shoot pythons, but how to force them to reveal themselves. The answer sounded simple, yet it was filled with risk. Pythons did not need to be found by humans. They only needed to believe that prey was waiting ahead. Weapons were nearly useless against a species that rarely showed itself. Burmese pythons spend most of their time motionless underwater or hidden in dense vegetation, moving only during very narrow time windows, mainly at night and at dawn. However, no matter how well they hide, their hunting instinct is always active. Pythons do not hunt using vision, but rely on three main signals, heat, scent, and movement. Their heat-sensing organs can detect extremely small temperature differences between prey and the surrounding environment, enough to identify a target in complete darkness. Their sense of smell allows them to track biological scents while small irregular movements act as the strongest trigger for their attack reflex. From that moment, the way of thinking changed completely. No more tracking footprints. No more chasing through swamps spanning millions of hectares. Instead, deception took its place. Humans began recreating the very signals pythons rely on to hunt. This idea was considered extreme, but when familiar measures all failed to deliver results, it became the remaining option. Robotic rabbits were developed not to showcase technology, but to carry out one very specific task, drawing pythons out of hiding. These devices were designed to emit heat levels close to a living prey's body temperature, combined with biological scent and intermittent movements, enough to trigger an attack response. The decoys were placed along the python's familiar movement routes and activated during the periods when they were most active each day. From that point on, humans no longer had to search for pythons in the swamp. Instead, the pythons left their protective environment on their own. However, as soon as the system began operating, 
What appeared first was not the expected outcome, but unforeseen reactions that went beyond the initial capacity for control. When the robotic rabbits were activated, the reaction occurred almost immediately. Sensor systems recorded a sharp increase in movement frequency, no longer scattered but continuously concentrated around the bait points. Infrared camera footage showed python bodies stretching several meters long, sliding out of mud and dense grass, moving straight toward the emitted signals. The cause lay in the design of these devices. Each robotic rabbit was equipped with a heating unit that maintained a temperature close to that of live prey. The difference was extremely small, just enough for the python's heat-sensing organs to identify it as a real target. At the same time, a biological scent dispersal system simulated the smell of small animals released in intermittent pulses to avoid producing signals that were too uniform. The movement of the robotic rabbits was not continuous. Motors generated short, unstable motions, mimicking the behavior of prey gradually weakening. This very imperfection made the signal more convincing. To a python, this was a complete set of signs indicating a hunting opportunity with almost no reason for caution. The entire process was monitored remotely. Infrared cameras recorded footage in complete darkness, while motion and positioning sensors logged timing, approach, direction, and distance for each individual. The data was transmitted back to the control center for real-time tracking, allowing identification of when pythons appeared and the level of response at each location. In the first days, the number of approaches increased sharply compared to previous methods. Many areas that had not recorded pythons for months began to see adult individuals appearing at high frequency. On the surface, the system seemed to be working effectively, However, after only a short period, the devices began recording additional movements outside the original projections. Not only pythons, but also American alligators, otters, and large predatory birds appeared around the bait points. Signals designed to deceive a single predator species had unintentionally affected many others with similar sensory mechanisms. Areas that were once quiet began turning into abnormal gathering points for multiple large predators. Not because food sources had increased, but because the system had created a biological signal strong enough to disrupt the area's natural distribution. At that point, humans were still focused on measurable results. The numbers kept rising, and the data grew denser by the day. Few realized that what was operating was no longer just a hunting support tool, but a technological system directly intervening in the behavior of the surrounding environment. When the system was maintained into the second day, then the third day, the problems began to surface. Each robotic rabbit was not just an isolated device, but part of a continuous operational chain. Batteries had to run without interruption. Sensors had to maintain high accuracy. Cameras had to record reliably in dark, humid conditions. A failure in just one link was enough to render an entire bait point ineffective. When a device was destroyed, the cost did not stop at replacement. It triggered transportation, reinstallation, recalibration, and renewed monitoring. The burden was not a one-time investment, but the need to repeat this entire process over and over again. Very quickly, the question was no longer whether the method worked, but how many resources each result was consuming. And that question became increasingly difficult to answer. More concerning were the unintended effects. Artificial bait points altered how predator species were distributed in space. Species that rarely encountered one another were now forced into closer proximity, increasing competition, and making confrontations more frequent. Meanwhile, the pythons did not disappear. Some individuals gradually avoided the bait points, changed their activity hours, and moved along different routes. In contrast, many other species continued to be drawn to the artificial signals, causing prolonged disruption in the area. From this point on, the robotic rabbits were no longer just a supporting tool. They became a system that had to be continuously maintained to preserve results. But the more the system expanded, the greater the risks became. However, the greatest cost of this project did not appear on any invoice. A system like this required not only equipment but also people to monitor, constantly analyze data, handle malfunctions, and make decisions every single day. 
Each time a decoy was destroyed, it meant not just lost hardware, but lost time, renewed deployment effort, and another full cycle of monitoring. More importantly, the project began generating a different kind of cost responsibility. Once too much had been invested, no one wanted to be the one to propose stopping. Stopping meant admitting that what had been done failed to deliver the expected outcome. Continuing was expensive, but stopping was even harder. Alongside this came the cost of risk management. Every expansion of the system raised difficult questions. If species came into conflict, who would be responsible? If decisions were made based on faulty data, who would bear the consequences? Finally, there was the opportunity cost. Every resource used to sustain this system meant resources that could not be allocated to other paths, such as habitat restoration or controlling the trade of exotic animals. When these costs accumulated, stopping was no longer as simple as switching off a system. The project stopped. But the story did not end. In the swamp, the devices were retrieved. Inside server rooms, the hard drives kept running. In reality, this project left no clear victory behind. What remained was not the number of pythons removed, but a massive body of data. Throughout deployment, the devices continuously recorded infrared imagery, activity, timing, environmental temperature, movement, and global positioning system coordinates. Each device cluster generated tens of thousands of data points in just one week. When aggregated across the entire area, that figure quickly rose to hundreds of thousands, even millions of behavioral traces. At first, this data was seen merely as a byproduct of a project that failed to meet its goal. But when analysts began aligning it across time and space, a pattern gradually emerged. Pythons do not move randomly. Most adult individuals rely on a limited number of fixed corridors, repeating them across day and night cycles and across seasons. In many cases, more than 60 to 70% of movements from the same individual overlapped, almost perfectly differing by only a few dozen meters. Python activity timing was not dispersed either. Most adult individuals moved within very narrow time windows, mainly at night and at dawn, interspersed with long periods of inactivity lasting dozens of hours. The data also showed that pythons tend to avoid areas with high alligator density while favoring transition zones between shallow water and dense vegetation places where humans can hardly observe anything directly. In other words, what the project left behind was not a solution, but a detailed behavioral map where pythons go when they move, what they avoid, and which routes they use to survive. This was something that many years of traditional hunting had never achieved. From here, the story opened onto a much larger question. When humans can accurately predict where a wild species will appear, at what time, and in which season, the issue is no longer just conservation. It becomes a question about the boundary between protecting life and turning it into a system to be managed. The project may have ended, but its consequences continue. And from this point forward, the line between observation and control is no longer as clear as it once was. If you had to choose between letting an ecosystem collapse on its own or intervening with data and algorithms, which path would you take? The boundary between observation and control is gradually disappearing, and the issue is no longer about pythons, but about who holds the power to decide what happens next. Who decides which one gets to live? and which one must disappear. When all behavioral data is fed into analytical models, pythons are no longer unpredictable creatures, they become probabilities. Without ever seeing a python, humans still know where it will appear, when it will appear, and under what conditions. Decisions are no longer made in the swamp, but inside control rooms based on maps and precise time windows. Those who hold predictive models not only know where pythons are, but also where intervention is unnecessary, when to act, and when to ignore. That alone determines which species are pressured and which are left alone. The robotic rabbit project may have stopped, but from the moment data was turned into prediction, the game moved to an entirely different level, one where power does not need to appear openly, yet remains strong enough to decide the fate of an entire ecosystem. Robotic rabbits are not frightening. 
What deserves attention is the fact that humans can now predict the behavior of life itself. If you were the one forced to decide, would you choose to stop or continue managing life through data? Leave your perspective below. And if you want to continue exploring stories about technology and the hidden cost of decisions that seem right, follow the channel so you don't miss the next videos.